are you doing? Are you awake? I'd be awake with that song too. But it has a theme. So our goal today is to figure out how Log Nation can be inspired to drive change. So we've had a lot of challenges put forth before us over the last couple of uh, days, the last couple of briefings. We've been challenged to do things differently. The question is how? And more importantly, how do I get all of you to be the solutions? So it's great that we've got all these wonderful senior leaders here right in the front, and that's absolutely awesome. And they come up with great ideas. But trust me when I tell you, you don't want us to be the good idea fairies, because it makes your life probably miserable. So the question is, where are you in our solution? And our goal today is to figure out how exactly we're going to bring you in and capitalize on all the wonderful ideas that you have. Because you know, you watch your processes day in and day out, and there's things that just make you scratch your head. Why in the world do we do it this way? Why in the world do we do it that way? Goodness gracious, I'm a digital airman. Why do I have analog solutions? So what I'm here to talk to you about today is how we get after that, and how do we fix that, and how do we start listening to all of you in this room. And so think about how we've done LOA this time. We have a room full of about 600 logisticians, all with bright ideas. Why don't we capitalize on that? Why don't we put forth some tasks and have you guys give us some solutions? And so that's exactly what we did. So we put together think tanks. And we've challenged you with some of our biggest problems. And we're going to put you up on stage tomorrow, and we're going to hear how you would solve them. But I will tell you that we have got the focus of all of our senior leaderships. Right now, we have the opportunity of a lifetime, no kidding, to drive change in Log Nation. We have the SECAF. We have the chief of staff. We have everybody in our senior leadership team asking us, what can we do to drive change? What can we do to increase readiness? What can we do to drive down costs? And I will tell you, you don't want me coming up with those solutions. That's what we want you guys for. So how can you be part of the solution set? So we put together a couple things. We put together a sprint, and you're like, great. More folks locked in the basement of the Pentagon. Yeah, that was fun. But more importantly, we've done sprints before. What makes this one different? We've done a sprint. How are we going to actually drive change? And so the things we're going to roll out for you today are we're going to actually step you through specifically how we're going to go do that. Specific actions that we're doing. We're going to put money to them. We're going to put people to them so that we actually drive change for the right reason. And the right reason is to meet the requirements set forth in our national defense strategy. So the challenge before us right now is if you look across um, the sustainment enterprise, we don't have the resources and we don't have the resilience and we don't necessarily have the requirements we need to meet what's in there. So how do we get after that? And I bet you you guys have a solution. And so we're here gathered in Oklahoma City once again to learn all about those capabilities. But I'm also here to share with you a little bit about what a team, that team that was sequestered in the basement of the Pentagon for 60 days, what we have come up with, the team of about 45 folks, with extra folks in the MAGCOMs, in the acquisition community, all of you representing you on how we are going to drive change and how are we going to unlock the unrealized potential that we have. So if we get no more money and if we get no more people, how do we clean out the white spaces in our processes? So you guys have heard so much about theory constraints. Well, guess what? There's a reason for that. Perhaps that is the way of our future. So my goal this morning is to really touch on a couple of things. What did we do in the sustainment sprint? Now, this presentation, I'm going to touch on just a little bit. I'm going to give you the highlights and kind of the big north star that we're going to go after. And some of the things that you talked about, about going after fleet health, that we learned from Delta, we learned from GTRI, we've learned from our partners in industry. And we're going to capitalize on some of these things. And this presentation is going to Corona in, two, in three weeks. When I tell you we have the support of our senior leadership, I had the honor of being able to make this presentation to the Air Force Council on Friday. I had three whopping questions. 
everyone was on board. Questions really weren't important, but I will tell you one of them. Is there any way you cannot talk for 38 minutes? Can you get it down to 25? <laughs> if anybody in this room knows me, knows I can talk. The point is we've got so much good goodness here, and the goodness is coming from you guys, but you guys have to execute. You have to tell us where our blind spots are. You have to help us drive change. So I'm going to start from the top, and I'm going to go in a circle. But our ultimate vision is to drive increase of ready aircraft. Now, we're going to totally change the lexicon. I'm not getting rid of MC rates, not getting rid of aircraft availability. Heaven forbid, that would be just blasphemy. Can't do that. But perhaps those are backwards-looking metrics. What if we completely changed and changed to a forward-looking metric? What if we change the metric that is based on our operational requirement? That exists today. The MAGCOMs come up with that requirement. It takes into consideration what we need for our combat-coded aircraft, for our test aircraft, for our training aircraft, and there's a number. It takes into consideration our O plans, the worst case o, o plans, stacked O plans. So we have a number. But that's great if you take a look at our MC rate right now. I can tell you that it is ready today. I can't tell you if it can go tomorrow or for how long the jet's going to be ready. So what if we came up with a metric that is based on ready aircraft so that an aircraft is ready in the next, say, 42 to 72 hours, some period of time, for the next 15 days without any scheduled maintenance to capture the health of our fleet so that we can start looking forward. And so why those numbers? So 48, 72 hours, pretty much based on a, on a dock response time. 15 days. Let's just say I have a fighter fleet and I need to deploy to some place. They need to get over there. They need to get set up. They need to start doing their operations. I don't want to have them fly over there and have to do a phase right off the bat. How do we build health into our weapon system? And then how do we track it? And then, oh, by the way, how do we convert it to a number so that we don't have a, let's be creative on how we do our math? Because we all do it. I get it. But I will tell you every time that can be converted to a number. So for example, using the F-16. If I've got the F-16 fleet and I know, based on operational requirement, I need 676 aircraft. They can be anywhere. It can be in the guard. It can be reserve. It can be active duty. It doesn't matter. I need 676 to meet my requirement. But then I can also put the responsibility out to each and every one of you. Industry, the supply chain engineering. So the reason this has become such a North Star type of approach, and that's quite frankly what we're calling it, the North Star, we're going to get after 676 aircraft for the, for the F-16s. We've got a number for all the other weapon systems too, I just don't have them all memorized. The point is, how do we synergize everybody in this room? How do we synergize all of Log Nation? We all report to different folks. How do I gain unity of effort? How do you know what your particular responsibility is to achieve this goal? So as an example, and some of this admittedly we stole from the Navy. They're not all bad, it's all good. Except for when they're beating Air Force in football and then it pisses you off, but sorry. Um, the point is, okay, they were going after 341 jets. I was in DLA at the time. I knew that the supply chain, the DLA side, the NAV sub side, we could be, have no more than 61 jets down for supply, otherwise they weren't going to meet it. I knew what my responsibility was. If you go to any forum, anybody dealing with the F-16, everybody knew they could do no more than they had to have 341 jets. So everybody knew what their contribution was. So we're going to do the same, and they're going to be defined based on ready aircraft, based on not having scheduled maintenance over the next 15 days. And let's just start figuring out what sort of health we actually have in our weapon systems. So that is our North Star. Focus on performance. Now, moving to the next hexagon. Optimize scheduled maintenance. If you look at the amount of time that our jets are down, 45% of the maintenance time that you are down is for scheduled maintenance. That is a process. You've heard for days and days and days, well, okay, the last two days anyway, on 
theory of constraints. I will tell you all good logistics is done in process. So if we have a logistics process, and I will tell you phase and ISOs and HPOs and everything else, it's a process. How do you knock the white space out of that process? And if you use theory of constraints as the backbone, much like we did in the three depots, and much like Delta has done, and much like all sorts of other um, industry partners have done, if we apply that through our processes, what can we do to increase the touch time of our mechanics on those jets and knock out the collective constraints? Now, a lot of you are skeptics. So when I had that chart up there about Mickey Mouse, besides the fact that I like Mickey Mouse, our mechanics are saying, that's impossible. We can't knock the white space out. That's not how we do things. There's a frozen middle. And I will tell you, you're wrong. We can change. And in fact, it's already been done. If you take a look at applying theory constraints on the flight line, in the back shops, on our inspection process, we can clean out the white space. Let me give you an example where we have already done this. Fairchild Air Force Base, that's where I did my squadron command. Love the installation. But they have a challenge. In the past, their ISOs took 52 days. It's a lot of time. Now, they realize they need to make some change. And Colonel O'Connor has done an absolutely wonderful job at driving change at Fairchild. Got the processes down from 52 days down to about 32. Tremendous improvement. That's absolutely outstanding. But they can do more. So we brought in our teammates from Goldrat. And we applied theory of constraints, the science behind our, our system. And we have since gotten those processes down to 22 days. If you do the exact same processes, which they did, to streamline their HPOs and streamline their 900-hour pr uh, processes or inspections, they reduced 79% on one, 70% on another, and about 70-some-odd percent on the collective ISOs. And this is Fairchild Air Force Base. There's 44 KC-135s there. Just by doing that there, in the course of about two months, we have essentially generated over 1,000 more days of aircraft availability, just by cleaning out the processes. So if we take that there at Fairchild and expand it across all the other 135 units, think of the increased capability. There's no more people. It's not costing any more money. We're just streamlining our processes. And oh, by the way, think about what it's doing to our airmen. They own the processes. The mechanics, all of the folks, they want to have increased touch time. Happy mechanics are busy mechanics. They don't want to be chasing parts. They don't want to have to go chase, you know, hey, I need a part here, or I need a kit here, or oh my goodness gracious, what do I need to do to find my tech data? They want everything handed right there to them. So we're going to increase kitting. We're going to streamline our schedule maintenance. So not only are we going to knock the white space out, but let's figure out where we can do concurrent work. Maybe it makes more sense to bucketize all of the schedule maintenance and break the jet once, not every three, four days, and so on and so forth. So as part of the framework, we have come up with a plan on how we're going to do this with a several weapon systems, and we're going to roll that out to the plan. But the key is it's going to be standardized, repeatable processes, writ large across the board. And it's going to be a shared amongst the weapon systems. Huge, huge, huge potential. Again, not additional people, not additional money. Huge opportunity there. Obviously, not everything's maintenance. We got to have solutions from the supply chain side of the house as well. And so we had a team that was put together to try to get after the supply chain. Well, Clearly, if you're going to increase the throughput and the increase the number of inspections from the maintenance side, you've got to make sure the supply chain is joined at the hip. I mean, after all, OK, I, I've had the ability to switch between you know, the supply side and the logistics readiness side and the maintenance side. And inevitably, we sit there and do this when it's somebody else's fault. We can't do that. We're, it's a team sport. We're going to be joined at the hip. So how are we going to link the requirements from the supply chain to the maintainers and make sure those kits are delivered right there on time? Two, what are we going to do about ad additional sources of supply? So we've got a process in place to get after that. Now, that is great partnership with industry. That's going to take great partnership with the engineers. But we're going to increase the number of, of sources. 
Right now, about 57 to 58 percent of our, our items are all sole, sole source. Think of the increase in competition that we can have if we have multiple sources. The resilience in our supply chain, that is key. So think about it in terms of demand forecasting. Quite frankly, we're not very good at that. In our defense, neither is any of the other services, but we can do better. So what if we change our forecasting model and we have a plan in place to get after forecasting as well? All right, so I touched a little bit on supply, and now I'm going to move on to integrated repair. Repair network integration is something that has worked unbelievably well for 1,200 NSNs. It's great. The performance is absolutely outstanding, and the airmen are walking sky high because they're doing the right thing for our nation. So for those 1,200 items, as an example, by bringing some of that capability back to the flight line, one, they're happy because they're busy working on things, but two, the increase in throughput is huge. So some of the items that were previously designated to, to go through repair at the depot, because of a backlog, no poking at the depot, that's not the point here. The point is there's a lot of work going up through there right now, but there is capacity at the wings. Let's capitalize on that capacity. So it, on those 1,200 items, as an example, the average throughput had that item gone through the respective depot, would have taken 63 days. Just because of the way the process was working, on average, it took five days to get through the inter intermediate repair at base X, Y, or Z. From a financial standpoint, on average, there was a $27,000 savings on those items. So not only did we save cost, we increased throughput, and by definition, we are then increasing readiness. So, 1,200 items, that's awesome. We have the potential to do that for 30,000. So we're gonna pull the trigger, and you all are gonna pull the trigger, and we're gonna go. So when you say there's no bias for action, we're, we're acting. And it is gonna happen, and it's gonna happen in your backyard. But where I'm gonna need your help is that if you happen to be running that back shop, or you happen to be running the flight line, or you happen to be at base X, Y, or Z, and I hand you this widget, and I need you to go fix it, I need you to fix it. Whether it's going on your jet in your own backyard is quite frankly irrelevant. But if you have capability and you have capacity, and I pass it to you, you fix it, and it goes back into the supply chain. So, help a brother and sister out. But that's gonna take a mindset change. That's going to take a culture change. That's going to take discipline. That's going to take the, hey, I fixed this. I'm not going to throw it in my drawer or hide it in my rafter because I might need it at base X, Y, or Z. You all laugh because I've been there. I've been there too. Heck, I went through an inspection with General Litchfield when he was up there, and somebody opened up the cabinet at the depot and out popped I don't know how many parts. Ugh. <laughs> that was not a good conversation. The point, you laugh because you do it. I, hell, I did it myself a long time ago. <laughs> not anymore, not anymore. We don't do that. Discipline, supply chain discipline. At least you're all still awake. All right, so how do we build this to go from 1,200 items up to 30,000? And we're pulling the trigger on that. Repair network managers going into the SCOW. Yes, we're going to move a couple of individuals over there to help facilitate that. But look at the payback. It's huge, huge, huge. All of this is, the, is, is based on our ability to analyze data. Data, you've heard that five times, probably a hundred times in the last day, day and a half. Our ability to analyze data is hugely important. Yes, we want to optimize schedule maintenance, but the better we are at analyzing data, the better we are at doing CBM Plus, is how we can change some of the unscheduled maintenance into schedule maintenance. But I will tell you that analyzing data is not a core competency of the logistician. We have got to get better at that. And this is really where our partnership with industry comes into play and our partnership with academia. Now, we've got some great academic partners here with us, and we can lean on them. How do we analyze data? How do we convert our data into S1000D format so that we can do the right things and figure out where the, the mean time between the failures should be? We can figure out exactly when we should change parts. How do we lean into this? How do we think our way through these problems? And I will tell you, I bet you folks in this room have these answers. 
it's, but how do we facilitate that? How do we provide a tool to you so that you guys can get your ideas heard and you break through that frozen middle because we all know it's there? I will tell you that from that perspective, the senior leaders, we're all on board. We want to drive change. We're trying to do the right thing. But the folks that we're going to have to make sure drink the Kool-Aid without me pouring it down your throat are the folks in the middle. Drive change for the right reason. Whether it's with predictive analytics, whether it's R&I, whether it's supply chain, whether it's um, generating mission effectiveness, generating sorties, that is our number one priority. And I don't care what flavor logistician you are. Yes, if you are in an LRS, your number one job is mission generation. Yes, I know you have a responsibility to the base. I got it. Your number one job, and yes, I'm an LRO, yes, I can tell you this, your number one job is sortie generation, mission generation. So please don't ever forget that. All right, so collectively, this is a system that we're putting in place. Every single one of these has a specific action in OPR, a due date, and so we're going to track it. And so, yes, a lot of folks have done a lot of sprints in the past. And they're like, yeah, whatever came of it. I will tell you that this is going into our governance structure, and the rose is pinned on me to make dang sure that it doesn't fall by the, by the wayside. No, I'm not turning into a pumpkin anytime soon. I got to the Pentagon. Two days later, I was doing this. So this is my job, and you guys are on the team, and you guys got work to do. Just saying. Now, so I talked to you about you have work to do, because the center of all of this is you, our airmen. You are our most important resource. And I will tell you that I can sense collectively our logistics team is frustrated. Because a lot of you feel like your voices aren't being heard, or that you guys have ideas and they just can't get floated up. Well, I will tell you that's part of the reason why we did the think tanks. That's part of the reason why we've got folks out there that are, are, are coming up with think tank-like things on their own. Jay Bear is an absolutely outstanding example. They weren't part of the think tank specifically, but they came up with ideas, and they're so great that we're going to put them on stage on Friday. So to the Jay Bear team, great. Congratulations. You guys are doing wonderful things. So how do we capitalize on all this? How do we drive change? How do we put a process in place to get you guys excited? And more importantly, how do we start focusing on our airmen? So theory of constraints, I touched on that a few times. Everything that I've talked about this morning is based on theory of constraints. Where is the constraint? Knock it out. So if you want to learn more about theory of constraints, there's going to be a breakout session. I think it's in room either 17 or 19. And you can hear all about the great things that are happening with theory constraints. And we're going to blow that on, a, on its end. Right now it's out at Fairchild. It's on its way out to Ellsworth. It's going to Shaw Air Force Base. And then we're going to build on it. But based on that, we're going to start training the trainers. And some of those trainers are going to be you. And it's going to be on a team called Tesseract. But I will fill you in on Tesseract. Or actually, Kelsey and Garrett are going to fill you in on a team called Tesseract here in a minute. But theory constraints, I highly suggest, if you take nothing else out of LOA, learn something about theory constraints. Because it is a process that is how we are going to employ it writ large, and that is how we're going to get the white space out of the things we do. That is how we're going to drive change writ large. But like I said, our goal is to one, drive change, and two, increase readiness. But to do that, we're going to listen to our airmen. Those airmen are you. Because think of it this way, if you have an idea, and I empower you to try these, this idea, and it works, what happens? You walk 10 feet taller. You start owning what's going on in, in, in your world. You're becoming part of the solution. But as soon as it works for you, I bet you the person sitting next to you and the one on the other side of you, I bet you you guys have an idea too. And I bet you you want to have a voice. And I bet you you want to be heard. And I bet you you want to try things. Well, the senior leaders, and I will tell you the folks up here, all want to help you empower change and listen to you. Now, we have to be responsible for everything that happens, good or bad. So yes, you're going to try things. And some things may not work every time. And that's OK. You learn from those as well. 
But when they work, we replicate it, and then we share. And we're inevitably not very good at sharing. So we've got R and I ish or um, CPI issues going on at base X, Y, or Z, but we don't share them. We have all these great things going on with additive manufacturing at base X, Y, or Z, but how do we know where the capabilities are? How do we share this? And I will tell you that this is really where Tesseract comes into play. So a lot of folks ask me what my thought process is on driving change, and I will tell you, most folks in this room, if you know me, you know I'm not real fond of the status quo. I am very much known for this Apple quote because, quite frankly, the ones who have the guts to change things are the ones who actually do. And so I'm challenging every person in this room to drive change for the right reason. And oh, by the way, that reason's not you, it's us. Driving readiness for our Air Force. We need to drive change so that we can meet the requirements of the national defense strategy. So all the ideas I gave you, if they don't withstand an NDS type of fight, then they're not going to go forward. That's the backbone. But we are going to drive change, and we're going to listen to you guys when you do it, because if we don't listen to you and empower you, then we go nowhere. So with that, play the video. Garrett. And I'm Kelsey. And we're here to talk a little bit about a, a project we call. Oh crap, that was my line. Do it again, do it again. Script it, at all. do it again. We're here to talk about a project called. Dun, dun, dun. Tesseract. Cool name. <laughs> cool name, even cooler concept. But before we start on Project Tesseract, we got to do Project Gratitude, because we're not here on our own. Thank you, General Hurry, for giving us a chance to all the leaders. Um, EWE is a pretty cool program. It's part of a bunch of other cool programs. But uh, this time last year, we were out there, we were taking notes, and we heard our leaders challenge us to do things like they do every year, and we're pumped. But uh, from, from the DTs and the senior leaders who developed the logistics human capital strategy that sends us into industry, that sends you to the depots, that sends you to AFIT, the assignment teams that work that DT process, hashtag twas, that read your ADPs and that pitch you to the DT, to the commanders that nominate you. I first heard about EB as a young captain. My DO, my OB1 Kenobi, Shelby Henry, I don't know where she's at, but I'm calling her out because she told me not to. <laughs> she told me about you, how she went to UPS and learned how to see the world different. And then to my boss at AFPC, Colonel Drew Pate, he's here back on r, r from the desert. He gave me a shot to compete, gave me new eyes to see the world and a new energy to bring game-changing tech to our airmen. That's my gratitude. Mine goes out to uh, now Lieutenant Colonel Westerman. He was the one who said, I don't know what this EWE program is, but I think it's worthwhile. It's, it's going to keep you energized, or energized, and we need to give you the opportunity. So he started doing it because it was, like I said earlier, completely new for our crew field. He said, do we put this on your OPR? I said, I don't know, sir. You're the commander. He's like, let's try it. Let's do it. I think it's worthwhile. And then to Madison Gilbert, who was on the AFPC team. She's the one who I called and spent hours on the phone with picking her brain because she's the one that said, this is where we need to send you. Let's make it happen. And we're not alone. There's other EWEs in the crowd from Sarah. Uh, Tiki went to FedEx, Sarah was at Delta, we had Frank at Delta, Jesse was at United, and Brian was at UPS, but how cool is it? We, we're in the exact kind of Air Force we want to be in, because at the end of our industry tour, General Hurry to put time on her calendar to fly out to Seattle and listen to us and ask us questions and figure out how she could incorporate some of the things we saw into her strategic sustainment framework and how to, how to do it to drive the changes she's talking about. How cool is that, that a general would take time to listen to the opinions of youngsters, in her word? I don't feel that way, but youngsters, in her words, <laughs> and uh, give us a voice. So it's kind of a big deal. Um, so also, Project Tesseract. Yeah, she's not the only one, because part of our thing for EWE is that you have to write a capstone paper. That's right. So 
since we both knew that our follow-on was going to be to the half staff, Garrett was going to A4PA and I was going to A4LM, we decided, based on the charge that we were given from General George, to go out and find the industry best practice at Amazon and Delta and bring it back. And don't just write a paper that has an idea that may or may not get any traction, right? We heard all kinds of rumor mills. You write this paper, and then it goes in a drawer. But I think we've had a very different experience because we've had senior leaders come up to us. We've had lieutenants come up to us and say, we read your paper, and that's dedication. The first question we ask is, how many pages is it? And they say, 20. And we're like, you read the paper, because it's 20 pages. So this was our paper. We said, Project Tesseract, it's not just an academic one. We want it to actually be a business proposal. That's right. So don't write down something that people can talk about. But let's write a business proposal of things that we can go do. And it, we didn't want it to be an idea from the Pentagon. We didn't want it to be an idea from a RAND study. We wanted it to be an idea that we socialized with all of you, because that paper didn't get written without uh, lots of edits and opinions and commentary from a bunch of people. So it's cool, right? We, we're charged to change. Um, we'll get into the name here in a little bit. But uh, we'll start with a little bit of what we saw. So you heard from Eric and I this morning. This is the slide that I wanted to show you. This came maintenance cancellations. You can see 2010, over 5,500 cancellations coded to maintenance. And then fast forward eight years later, they're down to 55. So one of the first things that I was charged with, the Air Force told me, go into Delta and figure out how they do CBM plus, condition-based maintenance plus. So I said, all right, off I go. And I start running around all of Delta. And I say, how do you do CBM plus? And guess what I got back? A blank stare because nobody uses that term in industry, right? So first, you have to learn the language barrier between it. And then when you start asking this question, because this is the slide that has gone viral around the Air Force and has captivated leaders. And so I start just running around with this slide and saying, tell me how this story unfolded. What happened here? And it turns out, Delta didn't really have a clear answer. Because how many in here have started writing their autobiography? OK, not too many, right? You're just living life. Turns out Delta was too. They were just living life and doing business. So trying to pull their story out of them was something that was very unique. They, hadn't, they had to sit down and kind of do some reflection on that. When you start to ask the questions of when did predictive maintenance come into play from this story, turns out it wasn't until the beginning of 2016 when they started their prognostics and predictive maintenance. You can see, and Eric and I talked about this this morning, exponential growth or improvements before predictive maintenance came into play because of everything that we've talked about. How you criti critically look at your processes from start to finish, and not just local processes, right? Another aspect of theory of constraints is critical chain. Everybody knows the term that you're only as strong as your weakest link, right? I'm reading this book, things that seem like common sense, but then it dawns on me, man, we are structurally set up and designed to create little tiny links at each individual base Right? We do all of our CCIPs at each individual base. But where's the, where's the focal point in the center that brings all of those great ideas together to link the entire chain? Because we're all going toward one, one core mission. Right? So that's what I started to unfold at Delta. Meanwhile, at Amazon. Yeah, so last year here at Low, I was standing on the back wall with uh, John Harding, my other buddy. I don't know where he's at, but him and his team at JBear are doing some really cool things. And uh, part of LOA last year was the Flight Line of the Future brief. Who remembers that brief? Were anybody in the breakout sessions? Yeah, the cool build slide, Colonel Ski slide, right? The crew chief with the Apple Watch, the Google Glasses, the R2-D2 robot, the autonomous uh, delivery bots that are bringing tools, supplies, and box nasty to the jet so they can max wrench time. And then there's that ominous cloud floating above the hangar, right? Inventories, schedules. Distribution network all mapped, getting fed to a mobile app. And then at the bottom it says 2030. And I thought, no, we can do this quicker because I'm at Amazon and I'm looking at Flightline of the Future Tech every day. I'm at Amazon seeing their primary delivery drone. The whole goal of that program is 30 minutes or less, you hit click to buy, and a drone's going to pop out of the sky, drop it in your front yard on top of your building, or I don't know, in the park somewhere. Hopefully not hit anybody. Not a federal endorsement, by the way. Pretty cool tech. <laughs> Amazon Scout coming to a suburb near you. You want an autonomous delivery bot in an age of a tight labor market, rising uh, minimum wage, and already congested roads? An autonomous delivery bot that rolls at one mile an hour on a, your suburb sidewalk. It's going to bring your packages right to your door and just sit till you walk up. It'll pop. And then maybe cool, but reverse logistics. Maybe you want to send something out. Ship with Amazon. That's another thing. How cool would that be? You want to send something out? You don't got to drive to the post office. Post office comes to you. And who's got an Alexa at home? 100 million devices across the world, 
talk to your IT. You want information? You want to play a song? You want to call somebody? You want to buy something? Alexa, where's my part? I'm seeing the flight line of the future every day at Amazon. Go store. It's a little cool thing. I just started at the air staff. Uh, you want a lunch? You go to what I call the stop store on the second floor right by the main conveyance. You walk in. You got to grab your stuff. It takes you about 30 seconds to get what you want and about 10 minutes to wait in line to check out. Amazon solved that problem. Other companies would put in an additional checkout line, self-checkout. All that's doing is compounding the problem, outsourcing it to you. Let's make you do more work. And I always mess it up, and I have to wait for someone to come help me anyways. Amazon found a way to inject cool tech, sensor fusion, cameras in the sky, smart shelves, issue and receipt, just walk out, grab your stuff. It takes me 20 seconds to grab a sandwich, grab a Coke, walk out. It's a really cool thing. It's behavior changing. And when I brought Colonel Ski to this, he just looked around and said, this is CTK. This is a parts warehouse. This is a MoBag issue and receipt line. Why can't we bring this tech to the Air Force? If you haven't heard of a Kiva robot, look it up. That is game-changing supply chain technology. Random stow. Let's not store items according to human intuition. Put it on a shelf, widget X with widget X. Let's max the cube of our warehouses the way we max cubes in the back of jets. You store things according to how big they are, dog chew toy, shower slippers, DVD of your favorite Nicolas Cage movie. The, the computer knows where it's at, and the best part, a robot will bring it to the human, because that's the constraint in the warehouse. The way you ship billions of products to millions of customers every day is by fulfilling orders. Warehouses are where things go to sit for days and weeks and months on end. Amazon fulfills orders. Things come in, as soon as they hit a shelf, you can start buying them. And as soon as you start buying them, a robot's moving it to get it out the door. They send us into these companies for 10 months, and Garrett could go on for 10 years about everything that he learned there. That's her telling sure. me to go fast. It is. <laughs> that ominous cloud, Amazon's got it too, right? We uh, log IT team, I see them back here. They're working with team at the best bin. The guys are coding downstairs. They're delivering crew chief apps. It's got to sit in something like this. Alex Pagano talked about logistics under attack. He thinks about this all the time. My answer, if someone's attacking our networks, it's not to go backwards in technology. It's just better tech. That's the answer. So Tesseract. Where does it come from? We want to we want to write a business plan, and one of the first things you got to do every marketing every business MBA program would say you got to pick a good name. And uh, Saturday morning at 5:30 in Seattle, I I, my phone's time. blowing up. My bad, I forgot about the phone's time. blowing up. Hey, dude, I'm doing research from Kelsey Smith. I'm watching all the Avengers movies in a row to get inspiration. I found our name. We're gonna be Tesseract. Tesseract, and I think that's perfect because I just watched a YouTube video where Dr. Roper the assistant sec for at &L. He talks about logistics and maintenance airmen, and he says, you know what, this guy's a Rhodes Scholar, PhD, big brain. He says logistics and maintenance airmen defy entropy, because every day our jets, the Air Force, it breaks down and they build it back together again. Tesseract is perfect, because that unlimited ball of energy in the cube that heroes and villains wage war for is what we do every day, right? It's the elbow grease, it's the grit, it's the go get it attitude. And, uh, and that's where Defying Entropy comes from, and that's what you saw in the cool video. So in our startup, what were we going to do? Remember, we have to bring an industry best practice to the Air Force. Should we pick a process? Should we say, how do you put parts on the shelf, you know, increase stockage and issue effectiveness? We didn't want to. That's too small. Could you code an app? You know, could you pick a technology, an automation technology solution? Could you build a robot? And we thought, we don't want to do that. What do we want to do? We want to build a team. We want to build a team that can do all of it. And, uh, and it's a team of, of you, of us, the we, the royal we that General Hurley was talking about. You know, in uh, Silicon Valley, they call it a, a startup. And that's what we're trying to get to with Tesseract. And the coolest part is our leaders are listening, and they have the checkbooks, and they have the authority to make it happen. So what's that team going to do? This is the one-two punch. So you've heard theory of constraints, not only talked about with Eric and I this morning, you, you've probably heard it at Log at the University on Tuesday, and then you heard General Hurry talk about it a lot. That was Delta's best practice that we're bringing in. Match that with Amazon. Agile tech insertion. Don't automate a bad process. Fix your process first. Eric said it earlier. Fix your process, and then put a robot, put an app, put something in. Otherwise, you're racing to a red light. Uh, actually, well, part of EWI, you get to go to the other company. So I went to Delta, and Amazon's a tech company. Delta's an airline. I wanted to know, man, you did all this great stuff. If you could change one thing going back, to accelerate the speed at which you could transform yourself. Uh, and, and their whole leadership team said it was IT. We wish we had what Amazon could do. So this is part of culture change. And it's why software is eating the world. And it's why Chief Goldfein stood up last month at AFA and said, 
Hardware is not going to win the next war. It's going to be the side with the most relevant apps. So this is the elevator pitch for Tesseract. We want to infuse health like Delta. We want to inject tech like Amazon. Which means we're going to target, fix, and launch three different things, culture, process, and technology. This is the holistic approach. Everything on the left side of the screen is what we are pulling in from Delta. Everything on the right side of the screen is making sure that it's fit to the chief and to General Barry's comments of not trying to win or fight yesterday's fight, or even today's fight, but the NDS fight, the fight for tomorrow. So, so what process or policy would you change? And what technology do you need? So we need your answers. We need your ideas. And I think by now, you guys are all going to have a note on your phones pressing these questions out to you. No kidding, we want your inputs. So thanks for, your pay for paying attention to what we have. Thanks for supporting this. If you want to be part of this team, volunteer, because we're going to take interviews. And we're going to have a team of about maybe 12 to 15 folks at some location, probably down in the Georgia area to team up with Delta, to team up with GTRI, to team up with the ALCs, to team up with every single one of you. But if this is something you want to be a part of, then sign up. Send a note, because I want to hear your ideas. We want to get energy behind this. We want to hear the different ideas that you have, and we want to actually drive change. We don't want to talk about it. Quite frankly, we're tired of talking about it. We want to have a bias for action, exactly as General Barry asked us to do yesterday. So, thanks to these guys. They're doing a wonderful job. And yeah, we were listening, because they had ideas. But now it takes leadership. And that takes the leadership of all of you. It takes developing our force. So, theory of constraints is not something you learn overnight. So we're going to partner with AFIT. We're going to partner with organizations like the University of Tennessee. We're going to partner with Goldrat. We're going to partner with each and every one of you to institutionalize these things. We're going to partner with the guys at Shepard. We're going to partner with our Amos. We're going to, one, recreate LROC, and then institutionalize it there as well. So we are going to develop our force. This is going to become the backbone of where we are going, and we need you all on board. But I also want to emphasize the one thing. Logistics absolutely is a team sport. You guys have all heard me talk about that before. I don't care whether you're active duty, reserve, guard, civilian, it makes no difference. We've got to have each other's back, and we have to cooperate and graduate. We have to build upon each other's ideas. We have to increase the transparency. Most importantly, we've got to have each other's back. And so I'm going to transition a little bit from the test rack thing and talk about you, our most important asset. We need to take care of one another. So logistics is a team sport. So is life. And so many of you who are active duty or in the Guard or Reserve know we have just gone through a time period focused on resilience. So folks in this room know that every one of us has probably had a curveball or two affecting one of us. And the only way we get through those curveballs is to have each other's back. So yes, logistics is a team sport, and so is life. So have each other's back. I'm challenging you to go out and get to know one another. Get to know your airmen's stories. Get to know what makes them tick. Get to know when they're having a good day or a bad day. Get to know and have the courage that if something's not going well, that you have the courage to actually talk to them about it. It is easy to go around and have a conversation about your sports teams. Heck, I give Jamie Scholl's crap all the time about his Cardinals. <laughs> Told you I was going to call you out. The point is, get to know your teammates. The reason this is so important, we talk about resilience. We talk about the Air Force suicide rates. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that a third of those suicides are in the logistics team. We got to do something about that. And that takes us. It takes our leadership. It takes us caring. It takes us physically getting off your butt, getting out of your chair, and going talking to folks. You don't lead from behind your desk. So please, go get to know our teammates. Take care of our teammates. After all, we want to build a family. We want to have each other's back. So we have a family. Here's a great example of one. We've got an individual, Jay Kalin. Everybody knows him. Well, his dad was a logistician. 
went to Vietnam twice. And we have Jay. Everybody knows the wonderful things Jay has done. Well, he loves this community. He loves our Air Force team. And it bled over to his son, Hunter, who is also an LRO. So this is what we're trying to build. I want to build a logistics team that my kids want to join. And who knows, maybe you'll have another hurry running around in a year or two. After all, it's a good name. That's how we started this. The point is, please help me take care of the team. Please stay connected. And thank you so much for being here. Yes, we're here to connect the dots. Yes, we're here to build relationships. Yes, we're here to connect so that you know two heads are better than one. But we're really here for each other. Yes, we want to drive change for the right reason. But I promise you, your senior leadership team is listening. And I promise you, we care more than you will ever know. And so yes, I have the opportunity to run the, D the DTs from the officer side. Well, I can tell you we're moving them together. In fact, we're doing them all at once. Because we're going to knock the white space out between our careers. No, I'm not blending the teams. We're not going to have one AFSC. But, but we are going to build a team collectively, one cohesive team. And we're going to have each other's back for whatever challenge our, our Air Force sends to us. So yes, I want to build a family. Most importantly, I want to take care of each of every one of you. So I challenge you to think differently. I challenge you to help become part of the solution to get after the requirements set forth in our national defense strategy. But get to know one another while you're here. So General Kabenik, when he came up here and gave his unbelievable speech yesterday, um, yep, he's my brother. And we've grown up together for the last, well, a long time. Um, the point is, there's lieutenants out here that probably get to know each other for the first time. And fast forward 28, 29 years, or however long it's going to be, you know, maybe you're going to take our place up here on the stage. Get to know each other. We are brothers and sisters in arms, and we have a very important mission, but we're going to have each other's back while we do it. So thanks. Thanks for everything that you've done. And more importantly, thanks for all the great things that you're going to do in the future. I know we don't have time for questions, but we'll be around all day. Kelsey, Garrett, Myself, the theory constraints team's got one breakout session. The sustainment sprint, uh, sprint has got another breakout session. If you want a deep dive, go pick our brains. Thanks, and have a good lunch. <laughs>